Thank you, Alan. Hi, everybody. Good to be here. My name is Aubrey. I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic and a member of this group. So we're starting on page 63 tonight in the chapter called How It Works. And last week we finished up the reading of step three. So we've done steps one, two, and three so far in the reading of the book. We've learned all about the disease of alcoholism, how it affected us, what we did, why we couldn't stop drinking, how we could stop drinking. And we did our foundation. The first three steps are the foundation of our program. You get that done. That's like that's like pouring a concrete pad for a new house. You pour that pad, that house is firm. That's a good solid foundation, level, square, all nice. And then on top of that, we build the house. And every house needs a good foundation. So in the past few weeks, we've gotten that foundation down pat. And so now we're going to start off with the next step, step four. And it's a very interesting step. It seems complicated, but it's really not but it requires the same things that all the other steps have required. It requires honesty. We have to be honest doing step four. We have to be open-minded so we can see all the ways that things have manifest themselves in our lives that cause us the problems that cause us to drink. So we have to look at all that stuff. We have to be thorough and we have to be fearless. We can't be afraid of the inventory and we have to be um, willing to do it. And it takes a little bit of willingness to get, get through this particular step. It's something we've never done before in our lives. Nobody ever sat down with a pencil and paper when you were sitting in a bar someplace and tried to do an inventory while you were drinking. Nobody did that. Nobody ever asked those questions. Nobody ever looked at themselves. And now we've, we've come to the end of the road and we had a choice to make. We could either get sober or... Keep on drinking and die. So we chose to be sober. And everybody in this room has chosen to be sober. So we, we're doing this program that is the program of recovery. So we can recover from a helpless and hopeless state of mind and body. And now we're on step four. So on the bottom of page 63, the last two uh, lines down there, it says, next we launched out on a course of vigorous action. The first step of which is a personal house cleaning, which many of us had never attempted. Though our decision was a vital and crucial step, and our decision was step three, it could have little permanent effect unless we at once followed by a strenuous effort to face and be rid of the things in ourselves which had been blocking us. Our liquor was but a symptom. So we had to get down to the causes and conditions. So this inventory is going to get us down to all the causes for all those things we complained about when we were drunk, when we were actively drinking, when we were in our cups. You know, well, I'm drinking because the world's not treating me right. I'm drinking because my family doesn't understand me. I'm drinking because my boss is a jerk. He made me work overtime last week, and I didn't want to. You know, we bitched and moaned and griped and fussed and complained about everything. And for no good reason for ourselves, it didn't help us. It hurt us. So we've got to get down to the causes and conditions. So it says, therefore, we started upon a personal inventory. This was step four. A business which takes no regular inventory usually goes broke. Taking a commercial inventory is a fact-finding and fact-facing process. It is an effort to discover the truth about the stock and trade. One object is to disclose damage and unsaleable goods, to get rid of them promptly and without regret. If the owner of a business is to be successful, he cannot fool himself about values. So an inventory is usually two-pronged. 
broken up into different things. There's one part of the inventory that's simply counting what you got. You don't have to do any thinking about it. You just count the number of widgets you have. You have a back storeroom. It's got blue widgets on the shelf. So you count how many blue widgets do you have. You get a number. It's very simple. The second phase of which is now you look at the blue widgets and you say, why are they in the storeroom? Are they doing me any good? Or do they have any value? Are they messed up? Are they dirty? Can I clean them up? Can I make them sellable? If they're too damaged and too dirty, maybe they're, they need to go into the junk heap. Just throw them away. Get rid of them. Be done with them. Some things we find that are good. We just forgot they were there. We didn't realize it. It had never come to mind that we had these good items in there. So we take the good items, we clean them up a little bit, and put them out for sale. You know, so we have to take that inventory, but we have to look at those things. We Number one, we got to find out what we have. Second of all, then we figure out what the value of it is. And then make decisions based on that value. So... We did exactly the same thing with our lives. We took stock honestly. First, we searched out the flaws in our makeup that caused our failure. Being convinced that self manifested in various ways was what had defeated us, we considered its common manifestations. I use the word manifestation a lot, manifest, because that's things that show up in your life without you thinking about it. They just show up. They're there. You don't know where they came from. You don't know how long you've had them. They're just things in your life, little aspects of your life that show up, that become part of you. And they've been part of you since you were a child. The thing that we have to remember in this inventory is if you were young when you started drinking, when you started drinking and started getting drunk and alcoholism set in and you became an alcoholic, you stopped growing up and you drank all those years and then you decided to stop drinking. Well, when you stop drinking, you're still that kid that you were. You're still that person. You, you didn't mature over those years of drinking alcohol. So when we get sober, we stop drinking for a little while. We're lost. We don't, you know, we're older, but we're not more mature because we've wasted years and been stagnant for years in that alcoholic buzz, you know, that, that thing that we had, that oblivion that we drank to, you know, that stunts our growth. So that's why when you do your, that first four step, you look way back, back before you picked up your first drink. My sponsor told me to start from first day I was in AA and go backwards. And every year, write down something that was the biggest thing of the year, a good thing or a bad thing. Just write down the biggest event of that year and go all the way back and go back to all your life, back to where you had your first drink. So I did all that and I wrote this whole big chart and this was a long time. It's 40 years of me drinking. So I had to go a long way back. And man, I got to that point where I had to first drink and he says to me, okay, what was wrong with your life at that point? And what was it about your life at that point that made you think that a drink would make your life better? That it's something you ought to add to your life. You lived all the way up to that point without drinking. Why did you add it all of a sudden? You know, why did you start drinking? What was wrong with your life? What was the, alcohol, the purpose of the alcohol at that time? Lots of different reasons. Socializing, we, we were shy or we didn't, we, we didn't really fit into a crowd or something. So if we drank with the guys, you kind of fit in with them because you're all drinking. So it was a, a little, it was all about ourselves. And that was the thing is we have to see all the things that manifest in our lives that were selfish because those selfish things made us do the things we did when we were drinking. If you were shy, I remember I went to my high school prom with baby food jars of whiskey in every pocket I had. 
And the only way I can get up enough nerve to go dance with a girl is to drink a couple of them little baby food jars of whiskey. That was my liquid courage. You know, that was not the beginning. I'd been drinking before then, but, you know, that was part of my day at that point. Part of my life was to drink to get courage, to not feel nervous, to not feel uncomfortable. It, it continued to grow, and I didn't. I stopped growing. So when I was 50 years old, coming out of my alcoholic stupor, I was like a kid again. I felt like I was a teenager because all those years, I hadn't really grown much. So it's an important step. So we're going to look at things that manifest. not They're not so obvious. So we'll be looking at those things. So what's the first one? Well, it says resentment is the number one offender. It destroys more alcoholics than anything else. From its stem, all forms of spiritual disease. For we have not only been mentally and physically ill, we have been spiritually sick. Okay, so we look at alcohol and alcohol poisoning and being drunk and hung over as physical ailments. And they do affect the body and they do make us sick and they do screw up our liver and our pancreas and our heart and all that kind of stuff. So it is a physical illness, but it's that mental obsession too, that we can't stay away from it. We have to have a drink and we'll do anything to get a drink. So there's a mental issue there, but it's also a spiritual issue. Even though spirituality may not have been a real important part of our life, it really always has been, as we've learned earlier in this book, that there's always been a power greater than ourselves. It's always been looking out for us. Even when we were drunk, that power was looking out for us. So we had this spiritual problem. And it says, when the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. So part of a giant part of AA, the AA program, is finding a power greater than yourself, this spiritual power that can help us get over our alcoholism, our mental and physical parts. But we got to fix that spiritual part. And the physical and mental will be fixed if we fix the spiritual part. The reason so many people end up coming into AA staying for a little while and going out and getting drunk again is because they didn't deal with the spiritual malady. They tried to deal with the physical malady. They tried to deal with the mental, but they didn't use the spiritual part of it. It's a giant part of this program. And if you don't fix the spiritual part, the next thing you know, you'll be right back out there again. And for Rocco, we're on page 64. So we got to deal with these things. And resentment is the number one offender. In dealing with resentments, we set them on paper. Here is the first time that Bill says, take an action. Sit down, get a piece of paper and a pencil and start writing. We didn't have to do that in step three. We didn't have to do that in step two. We didn't have to do that in step one. But here we are in step four. And we have to get a pencil and paper and start writing it down. We listed people, institutions, or principles with whom we were angry. We asked ourselves, why were we angry? We all know who we're mad at. We all know what we're mad at. It's not that hard to figure out. I have a handout that I'll, I'll make available. I'll put it on the website. That gives you a list of all the people, institutions, uh, and principles that we can be angry at, that we can be upset about. You know, some people, it's a vast list of people, all kinds of people we can be mad at, all kinds of institutions, such as the court system. We can, the institution of marriage, we might not like marriage. Maybe marriage gave us a bad taste in our mouth over our lifetime. So we have all these resentments against all these institutions and all these people 
and we have to deal with it because it hurts us, it harms us, it holds us back. And as it said before, it blocks us. Well, what do you think it's blocking us from? It's blocking us from the sunlight of the spirit. And we're trying desperately for, to crawl out from under those rocks in the gates of hell, climb out of there into the sunlight of the spirit. We had to ask ourselves, why were we angry? In most cases, we found out that our self-esteem, our pocketbooks, our ambitions, our personal relations, including sex, were hurt or threatened. So we were sore. We were burned up. So we're going to make a list. And it says on our grudge list, we set opposite each name our injuries. Was it our self-esteem, our security, our ambitions, our personal or sex relations, which had been interfered with? We're going to make a list of all the people that we're angry with and how that hurt us. And then we're going to have to decide what was it that was hurt? Well, we don't have to make up the answers. The answers are given to us. It's either self-esteem, security, ambition, personal relations, or sex relations, which were interfered with. So Bill has given us all the answers for all the categories. Every one of our resentments can be put into one of those categories. Yes, you could break it down and make 20 categories if you want to. And some people do. But there's the categories that Bill gives us. And that'll cover just about everything that's wrong with you, that's bothering you. And, you know, some people say, well, I don't really have any resentments. Well, I say it's pretty damn impossible to make it through a drinking career without resentments. We get resentful at a lot of people, whether it's at home, at work, at play, in our community. We're mad at people. We're upset by how they treat us, how they act, how they bother us, how they get in our way. We're also mad at ourselves for doing dumb stuff, for getting in trouble. We get mad when we're on our way to court with another DUI. We're mad. When we drink up all our rent money and get evicted, we're mad at the landlord. We're mad at the court system for kicking us out of our house. But whose fault was it? We drank up all the rent money. Our families get mad at us because we, we spend our money before we buy the groceries. Puts our family out our drinking career. Damages and hurts our family. Puts our family in jeopardy. So we got to make this a list. And so on page 65, you see a sample list. Okay. It has three columns. And we're actually going to add a fourth column. Um, but it says, I'm resentful at. And it's got names going down. The next one, it says, the cause. What is the relationship between that person and me? And what was the cause of the resentment that I have? And what did it affect? And if you look at that, it's not done on a spreadsheet. It's done in three columns. And you make a list of all the names straight down the side, leaving plenty of room to write the cause next to it. But you do all the names first. Then you do all the causes. And the reason you do that is to see the cycle that goes through. And I, it was suggested to me to do like all your relatives, mother, father, aunts, uncles, brothers, sisters, cousins, nieces, nephews, list all your family members that you don't get along with, that you have a problem with, or that you've ever had a problem with, because we have a tendency to bury our, our resentments. So yes, we had a, a resentment against our brother 10 years ago, but we haven't had that argument in 10 years. Well, did you ever solve it in 10 years ago? If not, it's under the skin in there somewhere. You got to dig that out and find out what happened with that. You know, maybe you're not talking to your brother as much as you'd like to because that thing is still festering there. So we have to look at all those things. We have to look at all our bosses over the years because our bosses really made us mad. 
We've got to look at all the kinds of people that we've ever really dealt with in our lives and how we had resentments against them. And then once we have all those people listed, we go over to the causes. And what was Mr. Brown's problem? Well, his attention to my wife. So whoever's list this is, one of their issues is jealousy. Here's Mr. Brown paying attention to his wife. So he's jealous over that. He wasn't like that. So he's mad at Mr. Brown, but he's also mad at his wife. Told my wife of my mistress. He's he's mad at Mr. Brown for that. I mean, he shouldn't have told Mr. Brown about the mistress. He shouldn't have a mistress. He's married. So who's wrong? He can blame Mr. Brown all he wants to. He's the guy with the mistress. You got to think about that. Mr. Brown may get my job at the office. Well, why is that? That's because you're mad at him all the time. That's because you're sneaking off to be with your mistress. That's because you're not doing the best job that you could do. And you may lose your job over your drinking. So you're going to lose your job. And Mr. Brown may well get it. Next one is Mrs. Jones. Why is he mad at Mrs. Jones? Well, she's a nut. Very judgmental. So he's a guy who judges other people. She's a nut. She snubbed me. Oh, she hurt his feelings. His feelings got hurt. She committed her husband for drinking. Well, an alcoholic doesn't like it when somebody else gets in trouble for drinking because that's pointing the finger at him pretty soon. He's my friend. She's a gossip. This guy's got a lot of issues with Mrs. Jones. Then he goes, my employer. So it's his boss. He's unreasonable, unjust, overbearing, threatens to fire me for drinking. So who's, who's wrong there? It's the guy that's drinking who's wrong, isn't it? It's not the boss. The boss is telling him you can't drink at the job, and the guy's mad at him for saying that. And padding my expense account. The guy's stealing money from the company. And he's mad at the boss because the boss says something to him about stealing money from the company. Who's wrong here? Next is my wife. Now he's mad at his own wife. Misunderstands and nags. Well, he's an alcoholic. He's probably a pain in the ass. She nags on him. She misunderstands him. Well. Weren't we all as alcoholics, didn't we always think other people misunderstood us? They didn't understand why we drank so much. They got mad at us for coming home at 2 o'clock in the morning and bringing some dirty drunk home with us. She likes Mr. Brown, so he's jealous again. Mr. Brown, because his wife likes him, wants uh, the house put in her name. Why might that be? Why would he want the house in, in her name? Why would she want the house in her name? Because he's not paying a mortgage. She's afraid he's going to get in trouble or kill himself. And she wants to have the house. He's unstable. He's an alcoholic. So she wants to have the house in her name. So then we go over to the third column. And it's it says it affects what? So Mr. Brown, paying attention to his wife, affected his sex relations. And his self-esteem. And then told my wife about my mistress. Well, that affected his sex relations and his self-esteem. Again, he felt like an idiot because he got caught with his, with his mistress. Mr. Brown may get my job at the office. It's about his security. That's a basic instinct, security. Well, you know, his security was harmed there. Because Mr. Brown might get his job. Also, his self-esteem. So his self-esteem is bothered. His sex relations are bothered. And his security is bothered with just Mr. Brown. Then we go to Mrs. Jones. Personal relationship. Because 
he can't get along with her and that makes his self-esteem low jump down to the employer again it's self-esteem and security because his boss says you're a lousy worker let's go you got to start producing let's get get to work and he's afraid he's going to lose his job then his wife who misunderstands him and nags at him his ego is harmed his pride and it affects his personal sex relations and again she wants the house in her name so that affects his security so all these basic instincts are being affected by what happens when he drinks that's all very important and we have to go through each person in our lives and figure out what did they do wrong to us that made us mad at them what did we think they did wrong i remember my sister i didn't have a great relationship with my family and there was one time when i got really angry with my father and he raised his hands to me and i grabbed him by the wrist and i threw him against the refrigerator and the refrigerator busted the wall and ended up in the dining room i said i did it because and i had some story of what he had done and years later after i was sober when i was making amends to my sister i brought that part up and she says no that's not at all what happened you were drunk and you went off off the handle he was just trying to get you to calm down and you you went off on him so i had seen it in an entirely different way than it actually happened and that's what that's what happens sometimes these things happen in fantasy not in reality we see things we did in our lives in an entirely different way than they actually happen that's why honesty and open mindedness is so critical in this step because you have to look back at those events and try to see what it was that we did that caused it what was our part in it so it gives us the instructions about that as a bottom of page 65 it says we went back through our lives nothing counted but thoroughness and honesty when we were finished we considered it carefully the first thing apparent was that this world and its people were often quite wrong so there is some blame to put on these other people but just because other people are wrong does not give us permission to be wrong too so if they did something to us and we turned around and did the same thing to them we're both wrong so just because somebody did something there is no justifiable anger in these things it, you know we must be rid of anger because it kills us which we'll read in just a minute it says so these people were often quite wrong to conclude that others were wrong was as far as most of us got the usual outcome was that people continue to wrong us and we stayed sore sometimes it was remorse and then uh we were sore at ourselves but the more we fought and tried to have our own way the worse matters got as in war the victor only seemed to win our moments of triumph were short lived so in these situations even though someone else wronged us we wronged them back and we went harder at it than they did and we won the argument but were we the winners not really because that harmed us so we were harming ourselves what what are we to take from these things what are we supposed to surmise in our own selves what's our course of action going to be it says it is plain that a life which includes deep resentment leads only to futility and unhappiness to the precise extent that we permit these do we squander the hours 
might have been worthwhile. But with the alcoholic whose hope is the maintenance and growth of a spiritual experience, this business of resentment is infinitely grave. So there is a mention of what our goal is when we're in AA, when we're working on our fourth step, when we're reviewing our life and seeing how we acted. If we don't see these things, and if we don't see that resentments lead to futility and unhappiness, and if we don't see that pursuing these things makes us really unhappy, really uncomfortable, and blocks us, we have to see that. And our hope is what we read before. We have a physical and mental problem, but we also have a spiritual problem. And when you're at step four, you're thinking about growing and maintaining a spiritual experience. If you did step three thoroughly, open-mindedly, willingly, you may have had a spiritual experience, the start of a spiritual experience, the start of a spiritual awakening in step three. So you want to continue that. And we know that our step 12 says, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we try to carry the message to other alcoholics and practice these principles in all our affairs. So the purpose of the steps is to give us that spiritual awakening. So in step four, we see that if we keep on doing these things, our hope for a, the maintenance and growth of a spiritual experience will dwindle if we allow these resentments to persist. And it says, this business of resentment is infinitely grave. We found that it is fatal. For when harboring such feelings, we shut ourselves off from the sunlight of the spirit. The insanity of alcohol returns and we drink again. And with us, to drink is to die. So how many people in this room, you can show me by your hands, know somebody that died from alcoholism? A lot of people. Everybody. So we all know that people die from alcoholism. We know that it kills us. And we're in here trying to get sober, trying to have a spiritual awakening, trying to get over this mental issue and this physical problem, and trying to develop a spiritual sense. And if we continue to have these resentments, it's going to push us out the door and we're going to pick up a drink again. And if we pick up a drink, we're going to be and ask anybody that you ever know that's ever gone out in AA, when they come back, if they come back, when they come back, ask them, was it any better this time? And they'll all say resoundingly, no, it was not. And it was just as bad as the last time I drank on the first drink when I went out. So it, you go right back to that place. So if you were in a very bad place that got you to come into AA and you continue to have resentments and you continue to judge people and you continue to do all these things you did with the resentments to your family, to your boss, to the people in your community. When you continue that, one of these days you're going to just say, damn it, I need a drink and you'll be gone. Some come back, some don't. Some come back in a day. Some don't come back for years. And they come back more damaged than when they left. And not one single one of those people that go out ever come back and say, well, you know, it really was pretty fun. I had a great time for those three years I was out there drinking. Well, you know, that's not true because they wouldn't have come back. This is, you know, drinking can kill us. We all know people that died from it. And do you think that any of those people that died from alcohol poisoning or, you know, died from complications of alcoholism, did they know when they got up that morning that they were going to die from alcoholism that day? Probably not. 
You know, they didn't know that that next drink that they have is the drink that's going to kill them. And when they find out, it's too late. He continues, if we were to live, we had to be free of anger, not manage our anger. We had to be free of anger. The grouch and the brainstorm were not for us. They may be the dubious luxury of normal men, but for alcoholics, these things are poison. And I remember, I remember when I first came into AA, as a matter of fact, before I went to my first meeting, the same day that I went to my first meeting, I was in a place in a, in a institution and they had help there. And I was angry. I was just an angry person. They sent me to this guy and he had anger management classes. And he started talking to me. He said, you know, you got to count to 10 and bite your lip and don't say nothing. And I go, you know, I've tried that a million times in my life. And that's just not going to stop me. I don't I can't manage my anger. My anger is outrageous. It comes out and it's it's out of control. So I can't manage it. I need to get rid of it. I went to the meeting that night, my first AA meeting. And told the guys in there. Well, I just went up and saw that guy up there that says he wants to do anger management. He wants me to manage my anger. What a joke. And they read this chap, this paragraph to me. And then I found out that one of the things that I was going to learn in Alcoholics Anonymous was a way to be rid of anger. And it's working for the most part. So, and, uh, you know, the dubious luxury of normal men, you got to remember what we talked about early on. We're alcoholics. We're not normal. Normal people have one drink and go home. We can't do that. We're not normal. When it comes to alcohol, we are not normal. We have alcoholism. We have that allergy. We are not normal. We can't, we can't continue to be normal. We're not normal. Okay, so it says we turn back to the list. For it held the key to the future. We were prepared to look at it from an entirely different angle. We began to see that the world and its people really dominated us. In that state, the wrongdoing of others, fancied or real, had the power to actually kill. How could we escape? We saw that these resentments must be mastered, but how? We could not wish them away any more than alcohol. So here we are with this dilemma of having all these resentments, knowing that these resentments kill us, knowing we've got to get rid of the anger and the selfishness, which the selfishness should have been dealt with somewhat in step three. But now in step four, we've got to get rid of these resentments, and we don't know how. We feel justified in being angry at people that do things wrong to us. We can't be justified in that. We can't rationalize ourselves into believing that there's justifiable anger because there's not. And it's a tough lesson to learn. So what are we going to do about our resentments? We'll talk all about that next week. When we get into the actual process of ending our resentments and fixing it and developing a plan which will help us with all the resentments we already have and be able to thwart any new resentments from coming on board. Keep them down to a minimum. So we'll, we'll discuss all of that stuff next week. Thank you very much for listening. Back to you, Alan.